Welcome back to the Invest in Yourself podcast. Today's guest is former Mongols Biker Club leader Justin Delaretto, also known as Mooch. Mooch was also in the Vagos Biker Club when he was first coming up. Mooch details his life story as a biker and what all the ins and outs that go on in biker clubs. Mooch had a very long run in the biker clubs, but he eventually left and now he has changed his life around. He is now an author, a scholar, and a public health professional. His brand new book is called The Ride of My Life. It'll be in the video description below. Please subscribe to my channel if you want to get more interviews like this. And without further ado, let's get into Mooch's story. Hey Justin, how you doing, man? I'm doing great. Well, thank you for coming on, man. I really appreciate you taking out some time and your story is really interesting and a lot of people are interested in this whole new biker stuff that's going on, you know, the interviews and all the current news that's going on with it. I thought, you know, I came across you on Scott Bernstein's channel, so I was like, you know what? This guy seems pretty good. He seems positive. I really want to have him on. You got a really good redemption story. And I think the best way to start and get into it, man, is talk about your early life. Okay, cool. Yeah. Well, first of all, thanks so much for having me on. Um, I know we've talked, you know, on social media on and off a little bit before, so I've watched some of your shows and checked it out, and definitely was excited to be on here. So thanks so much for having me. Yeah. Well, absolutely, man. That's that's what it's all about—a good redemption story. So um, you, you're perfect, man. You're fitting for it. <laughs> but uh, you know, the, the first thing we can go into it is, uh, you know, to talk about your early life. What was it? Uh, bad rough growing up how was your family life i mean what what was it like for you growing up yeah no i think i'm one of those anomalies that joined into gang life because i didn't need it um <laughs> you know I, I grew up with an identical twin brother so man no matter where we went on family vacations or what i always had somebody with me right i always had uh, you know i always had a homie with me and we have the the odd relationship where we're like not the type of brothers to say i love you and hug each other but you know we talk a lot of shit to each other but we but we hang i mean you know we hang out all the time and so i always had someone there with me um, which I think was super beneficial growing up because I never felt like I was alone or an outcast. You know, whenever we started school, I had someone there with me the whole time. Um, but my, my, my whole family pretty much are school teachers and sports coaches. So, you know, kind of a middle, middle class family, not, you know, everyone knows school teachers aren't super rich, but we were doing, you know, we did okay. Um, and because of that, I played like every sport there was growing up from, you know, little league baseball, peewee football, um, me and my brother got into wrestling around the second or third grade. And, and that was our big, big thing as we wrestled all the way up through high school. So we spent a lot of our time, you know, playing sports. Plus, I think my generation of, of people, you know, I'm, I'm 42. So my generation was, you know, you get off school, you go ride your bike around town, meet up with your friends. But we were always meeting up at the park and playing football or kickball or just sports were a big part of our life, just those pro social activities. So I really stayed out of trouble for the most part. I think the one probably caveat to that would be um, my my brother had started fighting a little bit in grade school and because we were competitive with each other you know like I remember the the first time he hit this kid we, were, we had been watching the A team and you know when they fight like it's that cool like <laughs> when you hit somebody it's this crazy cool noise so my brother punches this kid and it doesn't make that noise and I'm like man you're not doing it right so then I punched him and you know it turned out we were just being <laughs> being dicks um <laughs> But we had a little bit, you know, from probably from wrestling and then probably, you know, just being twins and establishing an identity. We we got into, you know, as we grew up more, we started fighting quite a bit in school and getting in trouble for fighting. But it wasn't like that type of story where we're like we had to fight to survive. We were choosing it, you know, mm -hmm. um, for, for, for probably various reasons. Um, we both went to like kind of a country middle school because we, we had moved for a little bit. And I think there was a pretty like, uh, you know, country kids pretty much know what they're going to do with their lives or they don't care about school. They already have their lives figured out. They know what they're, you know what I mean? Most of them are getting yeah. into farming or agriculture. They already know what they're doing. So there was a lot of fighting there. And I think that really introduced me to that, that kind of lifestyle. And, and I was young and immature and I was a twin and I was trying to establish my own identity. So at the time, my goal was to try and be known as a tough guy. Um, so we, we fought a lot and we were in and out of jail quite a bit for fighting. Um, I got my first uh, juvenile felony at 16 for assault. And at 18, I got an adult felony for assault. Um, so, you know, I, I had a very good upbringing, supportive family. They were amazing, still are amazing. They would do anything for me. Um, but any trouble I got into it, you know, I kind of caused it on my own. It wasn't like, um, the type of story where, you know, people are reaching out for gangs cause they needed a family or, or, you know, felt needed that feeling. I never had, I never had that, um, for whatever reason, you know, I, I, I think personally, I think I did it for, um, identity purposes. I was a twin. I was trying to establish my own identity, um, and when I got into like punk rock and stuff like that, I got um, I was into the punk rock scene pretty heavy. And then in, in high school, I was wearing a, a dead Kennedy shirt and the back of it said Nazi punks fuck off. 
And at the time, the high school I was, me and my brother went to different high schools because um, my parents didn't want us like to compete against each other in wrestling for the same weight class. Uh-huh. And, and they, my mom wanted us to have different identities too, like maybe some different friend groups. You know, um, it didn't work out. But in high school, he was kind of more into the cowboy thing. He, he was like doing roping and some rodeo stuff, and I was really into punk rock. And I was getting there, my high school was was full of these white power skinheads in a, in a gang called Volksfront. And because my shirt said Nazi punks fuck off, obviously I got bullied by him, right? So they they kept calling me a sharp, and I didn't know what that was. And, I don't uh, even know what that is. Yeah, well, so this is pre-internet, right? So someone calls you something, you can't just look it up. So, you know, I had to go. I'm that guy that anything I've gotten into, I just read a ton about. So I went, Portland has this huge book, bookstore called Powell's Books. I still think it's like the biggest bookstore in, in all the United States. And I went up there trying to find books on skinheads and sharp and, you know, what it what it means and and – Sharp stands for skinheads against racial prejudice. And it, and it, and it really goes back into like how the traditional skinhead scene was, you know, it was built on West Indian J- Jamaican music. It was built off, you know, multi, it was mainly white, your white uh, guys from England kind of assimilating from Jamaican and, and, you know, ska reggae influences. And so the traditional skinhead scene was, was not racist at all. In fact, there wasn't politics. It was much like punk rock was right. Like we dressed a certain way and listened to a certain type of music. And then in the 80s and 90s, because they were, you know, getting a lot of media coverage and they looked tough and they were fighting a lot, you know, different political movements got involved and there ended up being like, you know, the right wing white power skinheads and then the traditional ones. And so I think it was in the 90s or so Sharp started in the United States where they were saying, yeah, we're skinheads, but we're not racist because we all essentially we all look the same and most people don't know the difference. So they were they were pronouncing, hey, we're not racist. And so these guys thought that's what I was. Um, And so I decided, fuck it, that's what I'll be then. And so. (laughs) I think part of it too. So that got me into a lot of trouble, right? A lot of fighting. It was like very gang oriented, but I think in my mind, a lot of it, I thought I was being like a social justice warrior. Like, I mean, that wasn't a term back then, (laughs) you know what I mean? But (laughs) but with current politics, I think that's the best way to put it. Cause here I am, you know, I'm doing violent stuff and getting a lot of street fights, but in my head, I'm like, I'm doing this because I'm fighting racism, fighting Nazis. And, and so I I thought I was justified in my violence. Looking back, that's pretty silly, but, but, (laughs) Yeah. But that's kind of what roped me into that stuff. And, and I, that was probably up until my early 20s, how I spent my life, you know, going to going to concerts and and, and really focusing on, on physically fighting neo-Nazi skinheads. Yeah. And I could see the whole aspect of it, like, you know, wanting to be not really that you wanted to be in the criminal life or, you know, fighting and stuff. But it's like, uh, you know, these guys, they're, they're the considered assholes and they're starting stuff and just pick it on a race for whatever their reasons are. I mean, nothing's justified for it. But. For you, I mean, just getting into these fights, I mean, it's got to make you as a young kid feel good. You're doing a service to the society. Absolutely. And for them, they're like, what is wrong with you? You're supposed to be with us. I mean, you're white. You got a skin and stuff. And they're like, you're weird. But, you know, it's it, it's it's weird, man. But I'm, I'm sure you found, you know, you're it sounds like growing up. I mean, you wanted to have your own ident- identity and stuff. And. I mean, it is, it's hard, you know, being, I would, I would imagine being an identical twin. I mean, there's twins that don't look the same, but you know, you're, if you're an identical, I mean, it, I've, I've grown up with, you know, twins and seen them and stuff. And it's like, okay, I know that you're a different twin cause you got the mole, but you know, other people, right. they don't, they have no clue. <laughs> they have no and clue especially, man. you know, growing up, we, that's him behind me in the photo behind me. That's me and him. Oh, and, okay. and, uh, you know, we've gotten to the point now that we've gotten older and stuff, you know, we have different tattoos, you know, or, or little different sizes, but if you if you didn't know I had a twin brother and you saw him walking around, you'd be like, oh, there's Mooch, you know, <laughs> and because we went to different high schools, it was, you know, I didn't meet new people right out of the, out of the gate. We're like, hey, what's up? I have a twin. So, I, you know, we'd go through these things where people from high school would run into, you know, think they're running into me at the mall or downtown and, and my brother wouldn't say hi to him. And then the, I'd see him at school and they're like, man, why are you being a dick? Why won't you acknowledge <laughs> me? Because people, you know, side by side, you could usually tell us apart. But if you saw us separate, yeah, and you didn't you know, know. Yeah. we looked that much alike, you know, yeah. Um, but yeah, and then and then you know the other thing about the Nazi stuff is we were going to a lot of you know I was really into punk rock. I ended up being in a band, um, and and we were playing like you know we 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 toured the country for like four years. We were playing like the Warp tours. We played at CBGBs. We played with some big like some of the bigger name punk bands. So nothing huge, but you know we put three records out on some smaller labels. And so the other big thing with that is, is around that time that neo Nazi scene they were also going to punk shows and they were you know they were being bullies and and they you know obviously harassing people of other races, but they were, you know, harassing white people too. And, you know, they were anti hippie and, and whatever, they were just, they were bullies. So mm-hmm. part of what we were doing, or at least what we thought we were doing was the righteous thing by kicking them out of our scene. 
Now, you know, as a social worker and as an adult, I know now that, you know, we probably weren't much different than them, right? <laughs> we were pretty, we hated them for what they were and we were hating them for, for the same thing they were hating on other people. Um, and it did get to the point where we, once we ran them off, we were looking for other, you know, we were essentially looking for other people to fight because we were so used to that lifestyle. Mm-hmm. And I'm sure we were ended up being bullies too. And I, I don't say that like something to be proud of, but I think that was just the nature of the beast. Um, but that, you know, that's why at the time we felt very justified in it, right? Like we're keeping our scene safe. We're keeping our neighborhood safe. Like, Hey, right. we, we weren't necessarily on a political side. We weren't trying to really change anyone's mind. We were just saying, Hey, if you want to be a Nazi, you're not going to do it here. You know, <laughs> you don't be comfortable here. Don't be comfortable in my neighborhood. Yeah. And it's kind of weird to think that that even was a thing or even still is. It's like back then, you know, the sixties, fifties, everything before that. I mean, it was, you know, the whole segregation and everything, but then you know, you would have thought it would have just died out, but I mean, it's it's insane how much it just stayed and how how I think how it's even... wild again too. You know, like so in the in the '90s, it was really big in Oregon. Um, there was several white power groups. They they it was in the national news when they killed the Ethiopian immigrant in Portland simply for being you know Ethiopian. Um, and you know, obviously, murder gets the news, especially then. You know, back then too. And so you know, Portland and, and Oregon were really known for that. And you know, Oregon's a really white place. There's not you know. Not a, it's a little different now, but, you know, for the most part, it was, you know, a pretty right wing white place. And, and there was a lot of these, the Aryan nations were in Idaho. There's a lot of these organizations setting up in the Midwest because it was the great white, white North, they called it. You know, it was easy for them to like, say, you know, stay with their own type of people. And so there was a lot of bleed over that into the city and into other stuff. Um, and, and in our minds, as, you know, immature kids, the best way to fight them was just to physically fight them, make them uncomfortable and run them off. So, so I, <laughs> I, I spent, I would say I got into that lifestyle about 15 and, and got out of it around two, around 25. I mean, really, I, I went pretty much from that straight into the biker scene when I, you know, I kind of was getting over it. And my band had been touring for five years. So I was, we'd be like on the road for a month or two, be home for a month or two on the road. And, and so, you know, I was kind of getting out of touch of what was going on in town and, and, kind of getting an outside perspective and kind of stepping away from stuff and you know it was ready for it it was time for me to kind of feel like to leave that scene I always felt like that skinhead scene as a youth culture just like punk rock or anything else and I don't knock the dudes that are still doing it um by any means but I mean you know as far as being active and going to concerts and getting in fights at concerts that's like that's stuff for kids you know you don't want to be that 30 year old that's beating up teenagers at a concert yeah. right <laughs> yeah. so, so around 25 i was like i was just ready for something different yeah okay so that's what i was gonna segue into like so that sounds like that's what finalized your thing with you know being in the band and going into fights with the at the concerts with these nazi groups but you still had uh, you still had a need you still had that want or that urge to want to be part of a group you know what i mean so you absolutely you, and i honestly feel like i kind of always did and i don't know if it came from being on team sports um you know I, I, who, who knows i mean there, there's a lot of probably things to it um but you know yeah you know i grew up on the team sport where like oh this is my team you know you, you know you're proud of who you're with and then right. went straight to you know a gang where you know i was proud of my group and our name and what we were doing and so that was obviously still a big part of my life so even though i was trying to put some of that stuff behind me, that, that feeling of belonging, that sense of like being a, a part of something bigger than yourself was still a big need for me for sure. So what uh, did you ultimately join? If I'm correct, it was the, the Vagos. Is that how you say it? Yeah. Well, actually the first club I, I hung around with was called the outsiders. So I, mm-hmm. I, I, me and my brother towards like in the skinhead scene, it's really popular. It's just funny to most people, but to ride Vespas, like those old vintage Vespa scooters. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, probably around 18 or 19, we were, we were riding scooters all over town and going to like, there was certain scooter clubs in town that we never joined or anything, but we'd go to their parties and hang out. And from riding scooters, one of the older skinhead dudes had a Harley and he was like, tried to talk us into riding it. And as soon as I did, I fell in love. I was like, well, th- this is what riding the two wheels is supposed to be like, you know, yeah. the, the, the power, the, the torque that just, the, you know, obviously the power difference between that and 150 cc <laughs> scooter was pretty huge. Um, I would imagine. But yeah, I mean, I already loved riding. So this was like, you know, that next level of riding. And so, we got really heavy into riding and then, and then I'm that guy that if I'm into something, just like when I got into the skin and scene, I read everything about it. And and when I got into motorcycles, I was reading everything in the world about motorcycle clubs because there's, there was clubs in Portland. There still are like the, the gypsy jokers have been there since like the 1950s, I believe. Um, and we kind of knew who they were, but we heard all the folklore of it, right? Like, Oh, don't mess with those guys. They'll stab you or oh, they're all crazy criminals. And you know, all, all the stuff that I think the outside world thinks of one percenters, without really knowing 
Um, mm-hmm. And so, you know, it was a hard scene to start coming around because, you know, it was intimidating. It was a little scary. I didn't know anything about it. Um, but I met a guy in a club called The Outsiders. And same thing. They'd been in Portland since the 60s. They weren't at the time. They weren't claiming to be a one percenter club. They instead of wearing like an Oregon bottom rocker, they wore a Portland one. Mm-hmm. They started in Portland and Portland was pretty much theirs. And so for me, it was like a good stepping stone because I was like, OK, this will introduce me to motorcycle clubs. You know, I can. I was under this impression that I needed to show them that I was a local tough guy and try to prove myself to them. Um, but I was, you know, I was going to learn a lot of history and protocol without going straight to the one percenter scene. Like in, and this might sound silly, but in my head, when I was talking to my brother about it, I was like, and this is no disrespect for the outsiders or anybody, but it was like joining the army versus the Navy SEALs. Right. And I was like, mm-hmm. okay, I'm going to join the, trying to join the one that I can get into and learn about without going straight to one percenter shit. Yeah. Um, I was, that's what I was going to ask. I mean, you can't, just join the one percenters, can you? I mean, do you, how, how do you even? You we'll can, get into it. I mean. Yeah, you you can. You know, if you know if if you get invited, start hanging out, and then you hang around. You definitely can. Um, but to me, you know, like I said, I didn't know a lot about that. And and in that era, this was two thousand and five or it was two thousand five, and that era still was like that death or jail adage, right? Like you start hanging around motorcycle clubs, and the older guys would tell you, "Hey, man, be prepared to lose everything. You're going to lose your job and your." you know, your, your wife and you might go to prison. And, and so, you know, thinking of that, thinking of that lifestyle and then you think one percenter, I'm like, wow, that, I don't know if I have what it takes for that. Mm-hmm. Um, so I, yeah. I went and I don't mean this, like I said, I don't mean like the outsiders aren't a real deal and they are considered one percenters now and, and they're a great club, but they were just a smaller club. I felt more of like a family club. Um, another big part was in that skinhead gang I was in, you know, everything was pretty violent and, and guy, I was, I was just telling my wife about this the other day like in the motorcycle world, there's a lot of rules. And if you violate a rule, there's often a fine or maybe you reprospect. But in the, in, in our, in our skinny gang, if you messed up, you got beat up. Like you go to the backyard and everyone kick your ass. And, and then it would get to the point where we'd all be at the bar hanging out and everyone's getting drunk. And I'd start not being comfortable. Cause I don't know which one of the older or tougher guys is going to decide they want to pick on you or bully you or punch you, you know? Yeah. And, and then that, everyone's that, jumping. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And that's, so, you know, you can never be comfortable around your own, for all, all, your own friends and, and it's supposed to be your family. And right. uh, which that's part of that culture. So I don't even say that like negatively, but that's all I knew. And when I was, so when I started hanging out with the outsiders, they had told me they have a rule that brothers aren't allowed to fight brothers. I said, there's nothing that two brothers can't sit down and talk out. There's no reason for two brothers to fight each other. So that resonated with me huge, you know, like I I knew as a hang around or as a new guy, there was still potential. I'd get my ass kicked if I did something stupid, but it wasn't like bullying stuff. You know, I wasn't going to get bullied. I I wasn't, you know, some guy wasn't going to tell me what to do. And I say, no, one he's going to punch me in the face. Um, So that, that, that attracted me to it too. And then plus, man, I didn't know all I knew about motorcycle clubs is what I read in books. And then like what I'd heard. So for me, hanging out with them was like, Excuse me. It might have been as well as hanging out with the Hell's Angels, because to me, there were that was the local club. They had a good reputation. Here I am riding in a pack with these guys with patches. Like it was, it was a really good opportunity for me to kind of get my feet wet and get to know more about the scene. And because they were such an old club, they taught me a ton about history and you know what Brotherhood's supposed to be. And it was a really good first step for me. Mm-hmm. Um, but another really big takeaway that I had from it is um, when because so I was I hung around with them for a couple of months and I just started prospecting. But I had a lot of stuff going on in my life and I was trying to leave you know, street gang stuff and I was trying to leave a girlfriend I was with. And I really thought it might be time to move out of state, kind of put some things behind me, try something new. Um, and I remember sitting around at that outsider's clubhouse and, you know, it got to the point where I think it was the first time I really realized that, you know, these were all old, older guys, different generation. of You know what I mean? Like an older generation of bikers. <clears throat> some of them were kind of out of shape. You know, they have long hair and beards and right. were listening to classic rock and doing drugs that I don't do. (laughs) And I just remember thinking to myself, like, man, you know, if it wasn't for this club or trying to hang out with this club, these aren't people I would hang out with. Mm -hmm. And and I don't mean that disrespectfully towards any of them because they were great guys, but they weren't like someone I would invite over for a barbecue or go to catch a movie with, or, you know, what are you doing this, this holiday? Um, They weren't people that I would have been friends with outside of that lifestyle. And so I, I decided to kind of step away at that time. And that's something that honestly took with me, all through motorcycle club life, no matter what chapter I joined or what club I was around, I really, really was always trying to build something moving forward that these are guys I would be friends with, with or without this club. Cause to me, that's where that real brotherhood comes from. It's like, these are my type of people. We have a lot in common. We, we kick it all the time, you know, that not just mandatory or not just for meetings. And and that played a big role in, 
kind of me stepping aside from that. Yeah. And I can see like how it's kind of like, you know, you go to work. I mean, you have all these other guys that you work with and, you know, I mean, they're your work friends and stuff, but it's not like it's someone you'd hang out with. Not that you dislike them, but it's just like you, you different ages, different groups, different Absolutely. interests and stuff. But you want to have guys your age around hanging out, having fun, going on, just doing whatever you're going to do. I mean, it's it's a different. So I could see. You know, there's a whole different generational gap. I mean, hey, yeah, and that's why I mean, it was nothing negative against them. I think a lot of them were really great guys. We just didn't share a lot of things in common outside of the club. A lot of, we didn't have shared interests. You know, we weren't when it came to like trying to sit down and talk to them about stuff other than motorcycles. You know, we weren't talking about what music we like or what movie came out or what book you just <laughs> read because we, you know, we weren't into the same stuff. No. So I mean, what was so one thing that you did learn from them is they they taught you a lot of history. And just how to, I mean, everything about bikes and stuff, basically. How many years were you with these guys? I was only with them for a couple months, actually. So, oh. you know, I hung out with them for a little while, and then I, I started prospecting. And I think I'd prospected for about two months. Um, but that was a big eye-opening thing for me, too, because I saw how traditional prospecting went, what was expected of prospects, you know, uh, the rules and, and stuff about how to how to cordially act in a in another club's clubhouse, how to act around other clubs. Like, I, I learned it a lot of like the huge foundation that I knew moving forward, I, I had learned from them. So it was definitely spending time with them was a big positive. Um, it just ended up not being the right fit for me, but it was, yeah, it was a really good positive. Yeah. And so very so, educational. <laughs> yeah. And so I, you know, I let them know that I was moving to Nevada for work. My, I had a cousin down there and, and her husband was trying to get me on with the gas company. And at the time, so, you know, when I was in, I was in this band traveling so much that I never really had like consistent work. I think, when I first moved to Portland, I was working at the Hot Topic, and, and that's where I met some of the guys from my band. And, um, you know, so I was just doing, like, random stuff to get a paycheck. Life was cheaper then, too, and a little bit simpler. Yeah. And, you know, we'd be on the road. Like I said, once we got real serious with the band, we'd be on the road for a couple months, home for a couple months. So it was hard to have anything consistent. So I ended up, one of my friends from uh, our street gang, Rose City, they, uh, he, he owned an uh, adult video store. And so I, I started out just doing, like, night shift security there. And then I stayed there long enough that I was, ended up doing, I ended up managing the place and I was like there during the day. So I was there for about five years, which worked great for what I was doing at the time. But, you know, here I am thinking, okay, I need to do something different with my life. This isn't a career. You know what I mean? Like yeah. I, I even actually, what's really funny there is I actually first considered going back to school right around that time. Mm -hmm. And I went to uh, sign up for a local community college and I signed up for some psychology courses and I went to to one class, man, and and I don't know, I'd have to say I'd probably been out of school for six or seven years by then, and, and things had changed a lot. So I show up to my one class with my little spiral notebook and a pen, and everyone's whipping out laptops, and the <laughs> teacher's talking about how you know the first first assignments doing this PowerPoint presentation, and I was just so lost that I walked right out of there, walked <laughs> went back home, and was like, no, nope, I guess school is not for me. Wow. And I mean, just, who knows what would happen, you know, if you wouldn't have went through joining these other clubs and stuff. For sure. And I definitely feel like things happen for a reason. You know, things worked out well. I, I think a lot of things that happen in life is timing. Right. And and I, it, I just wasn't the right time mm -hmm. for sure. Um, yeah. and, and that's what another reason I was able to move. Like I wasn't going to school. I was didn't have any sort of career. Um, and so I, I moved to Nevada. And, and at first I was there to, you know, trying to learn a trade. I was working for the natural gas company and then doing some electrical stuff. Um, but man, I was, so I, when I moved down there, I, I sent a, like a box of clothes and I rode my motorcycle down there. So all I had was my bike and I was just so in love with motorcycling that it didn't take long before I was like looking up what clubs are in the area and who's hanging out where, mm -hmm. and, you know, going to local bike nights and seeing who I can hang out with. And, and the, did the outsiders had, um, they had been a friendship with a couple of smaller clubs in Reno. So they said, you know, Hey, look these guys up, hang out with them. And, and so I, I went to, um, I think all confederation clubs, most states have it where it's like a lot of the bigger clubs sit down once. I don't know if it's once a month or every few months. Um, and they talk about like local politics, uh, you know, like a lot of them fight like helmet laws or motorcycle harassment, but they kind of work together on like a political level, but I knew all the clubs would be there. So it was kind of my chance to go see who's in the area, you know, who I can meet. And I went up there with this club called the booze fighters. And uh, you know, they're, they're a lot bigger club. They're like on a more of like a, they're, you know, pretty much they're an MC for sure, but they're like, they're not a one percenter club. They're, you know, they, they pretty much get along with everybody. They're really like a cool fun club. Like they go out, do a lot of stuff, party a lot. Um, so I was hanging out with them at first and I went up to this confederation of clubs meeting and they had to go into the meeting and I stayed outside and 
afterwards they were they told me they were going to this bar down the street and this was you know people didn't have a, like cell phones weren't a thing yet it wasn't navigation like at best you can print out map map quest directions you know and tape them <laughs> to your tank um so you know you're trying to figure out where to go and there was a that's when i first saw the vagos for the first time and i'd seen i'd seen them on the internet it was starting you know internet stuff was getting a little more popular and some of the clubs were having websites and and I remember thinking that these guys looked a lot different than the other clubs, like any of the Oregon clubs I've been around. A lot of the Vagos were Hispanic and a lot of them were younger. There's several of them from the punk rock scene or the street gang scene. And um, there's actually some ex skinheads I knew that had joined. And, and so it's, it, that kind of enticed me too. It was more like, these are more like my type of people, you know? Right. And so when I first saw them, I was just like, Whoa, cool. There's Vagos here. I haven't seen Vagos before. <laughs> um, and it was the first time I saw Hell's Angels. I mean, there was, there was a lot of big clubs there. But when the, when I was I was sticking around to try and talk to some of these clubs at the outsiders that told me to look up and they didn't seem interested in talking to me. So so then the next thing I know, everyone I left and I'm standing around by myself and I was like, well, I guess I'll go try and find this booze fighter bar. And it was one of those like, you know, go this way, take a right here, then a left left here and you'll see all the bikes. So I'm, I'm going down, I believe it's Sixth Street in Reno, which is used to have a bunch of like motorcycle bars there. So a lot of clubs hung out on that street, but they each kind of had their own bar, you know. And I, I see a, a place on the right that they thought, thought that's what they had said. And there was bikes everywhere. And I saw some green. And I was like, oh, cool. That's the booze fighters. <laughs> so I ride in past their prospects. So now I'm there. And I back into this, you know, up against the wall. And I look up. And it was like all Vagos, man. There's probably 50 of them there. Wow. And I'm, you know, here I am. I don't know any of these people. And back then, because I wasn't in a club, I wore like a cut-off denim vest over my leather jacket because because I thought it looked cool. <laughs> so the Vagos wear denim vests as their patch, you know, with their patches on it. So I was like, man, do these guys think I'm trying to look like them? But I knew I, I, knew I couldn't yeah. just take off, right? Like, right. Yeah, I'm in it. <laughs> um, and I, I was sober at the time. I wasn't drinking or anything. So I, 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 you know, backed my bike up and parked it. And I could feel everybody staring at me. And I walked into the bar and I, owned, I, bought, I ordered a bottle of beer just so I had something with me in a bottle. And then I sat with my back up against the wall and just tried to act like I belonged there. And it probably took two minutes before people started asking me who I was and what was going on. Um, <laughs> but one of the guys that came up to me off of Lyle ended up being a president of a local chapter. And he was super cool, man. He, you know, asked what I was doing and what I was doing in town. And so I told him about moving and, you know, how I used to be at this other club. And now we're just hanging out. And my next day was my first day on the job. And, you know, it was one of those, like I said, cell phones were just getting popular. So it wasn't like you always had it on you or, you know, that type of stuff. Right. Um, but on my lunch break, I checked my phone and I had a message from Al that just said, hey, man, I'm just checking in seeing how your first day of work went. You know, I'm just checking to see how you're doing. And, and and that went a really long way with me. You know, it, it felt personal. It felt like, this, you know, here I'm in an area where I hardly know anybody. This guy's asking how I'm doing. Um, so him and I just started spending a ton of time together. I was going to his house for dinner, started going on rides. So it didn't take long before I ended up considering joining the Vagos and then joining the Vagos. Um, you know, that, that was the bigger club in that area. Like I said, there were younger guys that introduced me to stuff that I was like more interested in, you know, mm -hmm. it, it, it seemed like the logical step from where I, where I came from. And so this group of these guys, I mean, they, they let you come in. I mean, they didn't have no problem with you going in there and then they're just kind of like curious, like what the fuck, who is this guy? Is he like a fed or, you know I mean? <laughs> yeah. I'm sure they were thinking all sorts of things. They're probably asking who's dumb enough to just walk in, <laughs> walk in here, you know? <laughs> yeah. No, and and had, had Al not had their president not been the one talking to me, it probably could have went a, a real different way. Yeah. Um, so, right. it, you know, it kind of left out for me too, but it also went a long way for me with them that they were like oh this dude doesn't give a fuck he just walked in here and i definitely did but, but it was in a bad <laughs> spot you know yeah you just didn't want to look you know scared and drive off you know just you pull in there and then you're like oh no fuck this he well, just got and, on you know, and went in there from from uh i mean i wouldn't say my skinny gang was really a street gang i just say that for lack of better term right and the way it was put to me back when i first joined that crew was we ran like a gang in the sense that we you know we had leadership and meetings and we're pretty territorial, but we weren't making money. There, no one was selling drugs. There was no like a uh, no monetary value of being in that gang. And so, you know, I, I say street gang for lack of a better term because it was similar to what we were doing. But we, you know, we weren't out there hustling or, or doing illegal stuff outside of fighting. But because of that, you know, I knew enough about how to carry myself in public, what to be afraid of, what not to be. Um, and I think that helped me out a lot in that situation too, right? Like the way I acted and carried myself um, probably went probably went a long way with those guys. Yeah, I would imagine. So after they they start bringing you in, is after he's like you, you know you checking on you and he eventually brings you in. I mean, what did uh, what did that look like? Because you're only with them for a few years. 
With, yeah, you know, uh, the first the first year was a blast. You know, I think I was t- 25. Yeah, I might, I might have been a little younger, 24, 25. Um, yeah, it's 24. But, um, you know, so I'm young and, and we're just – Reno at the time was a, a lot cooler spot than it was now. It's pre-recession, you know, so there a bunch of the casinos and bars were open. And it's the first time I've lived somewhere where there's no bar time, like nothing closes. Yeah. So I was spending, you know, spending late nights and, you know – fucking off that new job I had. <laughs> um, but, you know, I spent a lot of late nights with them. I was on the road with them, you know, partying with them. And at first it was just fun. Like, hey, I'm in a motorcycle club and we're in a patch. This is what I wanted to do. And these are guys with more similar interests. So these are people I want to be around. Um, so the first year or so was a really good time. And then I, I ended up moving back to Oregon um, for a different job. Another Vago was looking for work and he w- he owned a tile company and he was like trying to teach people how to lay tile. And you know, I figured, okay, it's closer to home. That's a good trade. Um, and they needed help. So I ended up leaving and moving back, back closer to home, back in Oregon and transferred to a Vago chapter there. And I was living in, in Salem, Oregon and the, the nearest Vago, there's two Vago chapters in Oregon. One was called North Valley and one was called South Valley, but they were all the way in the Southern end of the state. So about three or four hours away. And at the time there was no Vago chapters up by where I was. I think I'm pretty sure there are now. Um, but so in order for me to stay a Vago every weekend, I had to ride three hours out to this meeting and, you know, or go out with the guys. And um, so I was getting, a, I was putting a ton of miles in. I was having a lot of fun, but I, and you know, the, the Oregon guys were a little different. Most of them were, were a little bit older. It was more kind of like that Oregon scene that I'd met before. And some yeah. of them were, I mean, I, I liked a lot of the guys, don't get me wrong, but it, you know, it wasn't the same type of atmosphere that it was in, in Nevada. And then, um, not to get too into it, but, you know, politics were getting a little different and uh, a Mongol that I had or a Vago I'd been close with had had been killed and still to this day don't know who did it. But there was rumors that some other Vagos did it. And I, I'm not saying I know if that's true at all, but it was something that was, you know, kind of weighed on me where I was thinking, you know, that I'm not into that. You know, I'm not even in fighting each other, let alone like worrying about in chapters fighting chapters. And there was a moment where our chapter was not getting along with the other chapter in Oregon. And we were going to have to do this sit down meeting and in, in fairness with good leadership, they could have just squashed it. But the leadership at the time was not very good. Um, and it got to the point where we were sitting in this meeting, deciding where we were going to stash guns and how we we're going to protect ourselves against other members of our own club. Right. And to me, that was a pretty big realization where I was like, man, this isn't for me. This isn't what I signed up for. You know, I, I'm no, I'm definitely not a tough guy by any means, but I mean, I'm, I'm no stranger to violence, but why would I want to fight my own club? You know, yeah. The, the Vagos were already starting to have issues with other, some other major clubs and we were already, you know, putting ourselves in danger in other situations. And I was like, now I can't trust the guys I'm with. Um, so the more I saw that, the more I really thought about that, I was really considering, you know, is, is this club for me is club life for me? Cause now, you know, by now I wouldn't say I was technically in two clubs cause I was barely with the outsiders, but you know, I'd already been in, in two clubs on paper anyways. And, you know, both decided both times I decided, Hey, this isn't really, for me or really my fit. And so I was kind of wondering if club stuff was really for me and still was still an active uh, Vago. And I had met maybe one or, you know, I'd met some Mongols when I was in Reno, but never like really established a relationship. But I remember the Mongols had just around 2007, six or seven, they were really pushing expansion. They were, they were like starting in a lot of new States. They were moving outside of California. It was the doc era where he was like, you know, bringing in gang members and, and, I wouldn't say everything you say on TV was true, but some of it was, you know, and he was bringing in gang members and he was starting in a lot of new states and they had just, he had just started a website and the Mongol said, Oh, welcome to Oregon Mongols on the website. And so I had reached out to the Mongol I knew at the time and just said, Hey man, it looks like you've got this chapter in Oregon. If you guys, you know, if you need any, anyone to kick it with or show you around, like I grew up here and I was kind of fishing around cause I want to see who they were, you know, meet them. Um, and it, it turned out there, there was like one dude there and he wasn't really, it was, it was more of a publicity stunt to get, you know, to see if they can move into the state. Mm-hmm. But because I reached out, their national leadership called me and we started talking more and I'm sure they got the vibe pretty quick that I was interested. I would and, imagine, yeah. So I sat down with my chapter and, um, had told them all the things we were unhappy with and, you know, how I was starting to question if this club's for me and that I was considering joining another club. And at the time, my whole chapter said, let's do it. They all wanted to do it together. And so then I felt better about it, too, because it wasn't just me. Everyone was, you know, all these guys, we were all going to go to it together. Um, it didn't end up being the case. Only a couple of them came with me and, and several of them stayed. But, you know, I kind of was pushed it. And um, 
the Mongol I was talking to, he was kind of the one that was in charge of like the expansion and leadership at the time. And he said, well, hey, if you want to get to know more and meet us, why don't you come out to Daytona for bike week? And so I don't know what I was thinking, man, but I flew out there by myself. <laughs> I'd never <laughs> met these guys before. I'm staying with them. Um, you know, I wasn't in their club. I was wearing a Vago t-shirt the whole time I was there because I was still technically a Vago. Um, and I, I just went out there to get to know them. And, and we kind of went through some stuff together out there that, that was a little dangerous. And I think there was one point where something was about to happen and, and they told me, hey, dude, you're not a part of us. You can leave. And, you know, I was there with them, so I wasn't going to leave. And I think that kind of proved me to them quite a bit. And they offered me to join. And so I went back to Oregon and rounded some guys up and, and we patched over to the Mongols. Wow. That's and that was so, 2007. Okay. So, I mean, after leaving, what did they think of that? You, you know, you know, the, the Vagos when you were there, I mean, were they tripping about it? Did they really care? I mean, your, your crew that you were within the chapter, you know, the, some of the guys wanted to, or they all technically said they did, but only a few of them came. I mean, what, why didn't they all come? I think some of that was political. I think at first they all wanted to do it. And then some of them realized if they stayed, they would have a chance for positions of leadership or, you know, they could change some things because um, the chapter president was one of the guys that came with me. So it kind of left like a little power vacuum. And so oh. I think not to speak down on the dudes that stayed, but I honestly think a, some of them weren't sure if they wanted to do it. And I think they were just going with the flow. <laughs> and I think some of the other guys were into it for more of kind of a power thing. And they talked some of the other guys into staying. Hmm. So, but yeah, it, it wasn't uh, it wasn't a smooth transition. So nowadays, uh, Vagos and Mongols, from what I know, unless things have changed since I've been out, but they have an agreement where we can't take each other's members. Um, but at the time, the Vagos are a really big club now. They're considered one percenter club. You know, they're very well known. They were starting to get bigger when I was in it. But in the era I was in it, they still weren't really technically a national club or, or not to this, the level they are now. Um, so it, was, it wasn't really a lateral move. You know, respectfully, it was more of a step up, um, but there were still people that were pissed, you know, and, and part of that was because that guys that didn't come drove down and was telling them what we were doing. And, you know, it just yeah. it wasn't I'm not mad at them for being mad because it was a disrespectful move. Right. Like I, I, I left one club for another club and I, mm -hmm. and I took guys with me on top of that. I took a couple guys from Reno came with me, a couple guys from Vegas and eventually the whole Reading chapter came with me. So it ended up being like 15 of us that patched over. So it wasn't just, Oh, you know, Mooch and his brother left. I took a pretty large group. So, you know, it was obviously pretty disrespectful and, and people felt a certain way about it. Um, I did get a visit from the FBI probably six months into being a Mongol that said they had this credible, credible information that the Vagos had a hit out on me and my brother. And, 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 you know, man, I never believed in that type of stuff. And I can't even say if that was ever even true, because half the time I think that's just them trying to get you to talk to them. Right. They live a business yeah. card and say, well, call me if you call me if you feel you're in the need for protection <laughs> or help. But yeah. dude, they did it to me at my mom's house and my family's freaking out. Like it was yeah. pretty much just a stir the pot tactic. But it also describes the fact that things weren't smooth with us. There, no, we never like put hands on each other. It didn't really escalate. But there was they weren't happy. Mm hmm. Yeah, no, I mean, you never know what you're, who you're going to piss off. I mean, even if it wasn't true or not, but it could have just been an empty threat. I mean, you're still here telling the story. So, I mean, it, right. it must have been. So, you know, the, the the law enforcement, they, they for whatever reason, I mean, they, I mean, obviously they, they get in, informants and stuff to go in there. And I think you even had dealings with informants and stuff, but they knew what was going on. So they're like, okay, let's push this guy's buttons. Let's see if Absolutely. we can flip him right now. <laughs> you know, in theory, the way, the way they describe it or what, what I've heard before is if they have, if they hear of a credible threat on somebody's life, it's their duty to warn, right? Like yes. if, if an informant tells them, Hey, these guys are gearing up to do this to Mooch, it's their duty to warn me. Yep. But it's also on the flip side, I'm pretty you know, just a political move on their end. And, and it makes me wonder if it, if it was true or, or if it was just, I'm not doubting that maybe some drunk guy was talking about it, yeah. <laughs> you know, but yeah. I don't know how much, you know, how much that was really going into it. And, and thankfully, you know, nothing transpired from it. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, it did let us know that we weren't, we weren't cool. Yeah. And you weren't welcome back <laughs> in other words. <laughs> so you, you were with the Mongols for 15 plus years, was it? Yeah. Yeah, so I, when I moved, when I started that chapter in Oregon, it was the very first chapter of the Mongols in Oregon, which also came with a lot of issues because, um, you know, there's like four clubs in, in the northern part of the state, and they've been there since the 60s, and they were pretty controlling about who could and couldn't be here, mm -hmm. and uh, they definitely didn't want us there. 
<laughs> and, you know, there was a lot of threats from that too, but, you know, we played it pretty diplomatically. I sat down with each and every one of them and um, even moving forward years later when I've started chapters in new States, you know, the, the first thing I always tell these clubs is, you know, we're not, I, I know it's hard for people to, to comprehend this because it's just in reality. It's just ego. And I know probably in the seventies and eighties, it did have to do with like turf had to do with drug trade and shit like that. But most clubs aren't doing that stuff anymore, at least from my experience, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and so I would tell these clubs like, listen, us being here, isn't taking any sort of money out of your pocket. And I, you know, respectfully we would tell them we're not recruiting the same type of people. We're not going to take any of your ex members. And for the most part, we're not going to the same types of places. Like, most of my group were ex punk rockers and skinheads and we were going to the way different type of bars than like the old biker bars or, yeah. so we weren't even really running into each other in public. We were hanging out in different places. We weren't really even traveling in the same circle. So, you know, what I would always tell these guys essentially is you're, you're barely going to know we're here, but it's not on paper. It's disrespectful because of ego, but in reality, it, it doesn't matter. We're here. No. And, <laughs> you know, things were tense with those clubs for several years, but you know, after five, six, seven years of us being there and there being no issues, relationships started to change and, and and even if some of those clubs we never came like super good friends with we coexisted with you know say hi to each other out in the bars or ignore each other but there was it, it thankfully turned out to not be anything too crazy but there was definitely um potential for things to get wild those first couple of years yeah i would imagine because just these new young guys coming in after they've already you know claimed their territory and stuff they're not gonna like it i mean especially if they're back you know, their club's been there since the 60s and stuff. But, I mean, if like you said, financial-wise, it really doesn't matter. But who knows? I mean, like you said, it's just a whole ego deal. But I don't know. I mean, you, you maintained and you were there. You were So were you like the boss then, I guess, for of your chapter? Yeah, I was the chapter president um, of most of the chapters I started up there. But at first, we, just, we were in Eugene, and then we started uh, Portland and then Salem, and we kind of started growing around the state. Um, but yeah, I was the chapter president. And then I want to say it was 2011 or so we developed a program with now that the Mongols were growing a lot and they, they started being out of state at the time. What the Mongols were doing is, is like their mother chapter, their national leadership was all based in California. And so whoever was overseeing, like say Oregon at the time was like a California member. And, and the issue we were running into is say I had some sort of agreements with a local club or whatever, the California guys might not understand local politics, right? Or even know who the local clubs are or, or who's who in my chapter even, you know? Right. And if, if they're just knowing from what I'm telling them, they're only getting it from one source. And so we were starting to have these issues where the leadership wasn't being very helpful and it wasn't for lack of trying, but it just wasn't a good setup. And so um, I helped develop this program called the state rep program, or at the time it was a regional rep where someone that lived in the area that had been in a club for a while was actually the one overseeing that region. And then they would report to mother chapter, but you know, we were kind of the ones that were running the area, but making sure everyone's following the bylaws that chapters are being active and hanging out with each other. I mean, the Mongols biggest thing is brotherhood. And, and, you know, unlike some other clubs where like chapters are separate, we all tried to like Oregon, even have had five chapters, we always try to run as one big chapter when it came to like going out, going to events. Um, you know, oftentimes if you saw one chapter in a bar, you saw the other, like every, we, we kept all that together, but that was, you know, with kind of some militant structure based off that leadership that we changed. Um, so I became the, the Northwest mid rep um, or the Northwest rep for quite a while. And then when I moved out here as the Midwest rep for a while, um, I oversaw some of the out of country chapters for a little bit. Um, and then, and then help, I helped start, there was a club called the Raiders, which was in Oklahoma and there were an official Mongol support club. And we had decided we wanted to do some other support clubs in other states, but we decided we just wanted to have one, like one official support club. And so me and uh, a brother from Oklahoma named Jeff, we reestablished this Raider program and kind of changed the bylaws and the rules so that it could be spread across the country. So I oversaw that program and then they ended up moving into Thailand and Russia and Australia. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, that was, that was a really cool thing too. But um, so, yeah, I, I stayed busy doing stuff like that, not like in a power trip, I didn't have a ton of power per se. It was just like in a leadership way. Yeah. No, I mean, you must have been good enough to be their leader. I mean, they, they wanted you to be that president title. I mean, you, you must have ran whatever operations that they wanted, you know, organized groups and made sure everyone was getting along and not out fights outbreaking and stuff like that. I mean, they picked you for a reason, I suppose. And I mean, you had a pretty longevity in there 15 years is you know quite a bit of chunk of your life i mean that's that's a lot of time to be in 
you know, a club or be dedicated for that for to anything for that long of a time. For sure. As long as I've ever been involved in anything in my, <laughs> in my whole life, for sure. And and yeah. I think, like I said, I joined national leadership in like 2010 or 11. So, you know, I was in national leadership for almost more than half the time I was in the club. Um, so, you know, I knew a lot about the club and how it worked. And I think I helped change a lot of the ways that the or I wouldn't say change, but um, update a lot of the ways that the club was, you know, that we were growing and things were different. Um, so I feel like I played a pretty good role. You know, the, the Mongols do elections every year and then chapter wise, it's every six months. So it, it, it's not a dictatorship. You can't just say, hey, I'm the boss or, hey, I started this. I'm the boss. So, you know, you have to get voted right. in, which means you have, you know, you have to have the approval of the members. And anybody that's watched uh, Sons of Anarchy, they know. <laughs> right. How the, you know, how all the, the things work. I mean, I've watched it and stuff. I mean, you know, they sit at the table, they all make their votes and stuff. So. That's how it's kind of ran. I mean, the, the, any decision brought to the the group, the chapter, they would they would do that. You'd, I mean, are you able to even talk about that? I don't know if that's. Yeah, I can talk a little bit about it. Yeah, for the for the most part, almost everything's voted on because you know it's up to the chapter, right? Um, there are some times where you know you can make a presidential decision, or national leadership just says, "Hey, this is what we're doing," and you do it. Um, and but examples of stuff like that would be um, we're going to go to this run and. I don't care if you had plans, we're all going, it's mandatory. You just got to go because, uh -huh. you know, there's always those members that uh, after a while or, or whatever, you know, they wanted to be a part of the club and wear the patch and go to the bar, but they didn't want to be active and go to the out of state runs or, you know, the more challenging stuff, the time on the road together, the traveling. And so, you know, there was times where we didn't vote on that. We would just say, Hey, everybody's going. Um, mm -hmm. But, you know, for the most part, yeah, we tried to vote on everything. Any, any rules that were in the bylaws were all voted on by the chapter. So it wasn't like, Mooch is the P and he's saying this is what's happening. Um, you know, anything I'm, I might suggest rules, but everyone would, would vote on them. And so, yeah, it was a very, very diplomatic process. And the whole the whole goal, since we were so focused on brotherhood, was to not be a dictatorship. Right. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> that this be hard to do it like that. <laughs> I mean, people, you know, I mean, you can compare it to the mob. I mean, they have their bosses and stuff and you got to listen to what, you know, they do, whether it's, you know, treachery or horrible Horrible, horrible right. things. You know, I mean, you just have to. I mean, there's no say so. The group, even if the group don't agree with it, I mean, you know, you guys are different. You know, the you know biker clubs and stuff. I mean, they had, you know, everybody can vote unless, like you said, it was an executive decision. You can call. You know what I mean? Right. But, well, and I think that plays a big part to that loyalty piece. You know, I mean, uh, mm -hmm. obviously bikers are, are really known to be loyal and will do anything for their club. And a lot of that's because if you're if you're invested in the rules and you're voting and, and some of these things are your ideas or some programs you put together, then you're going to have a more vested interest in the club. You're going to have more pride in the club versus if I just show up and get told what to do, how much of a part of it am I really going to feel at the end of the day? Yeah. No, you're not going to feel like you're really contributing. You're just, you know, listening to the boss's orders. <laughs> yeah, and essentially anybody like can do that, right? So then I would feel yeah. replaceable. I'd feel like I'm not important to the group, but mm -hmm. if you're, if I've had a lot of members, um, or, or even times I've been in chapters as a regular member without being a leader, I always have the same voice in the meetings, you know, and, and there's a lot of guys that have a good, strong voice in meetings that often provide outside perspectives and intelligent perspectives that even without leadership, they're well-respected and listened to. And, and those guys obviously felt a part of the group and like they had a good role and you know, they were invested in the, in the club. And that's where that, that whole, you know, I would do anything for my patch stuff comes from because you believe in it. Yeah. I mean, you have more respect when you're able to, make this then you know be able to put your perspective in and people listen instead of absolutely you know not but what uh transition you out of there out of the club leaving you know the bike club um i mean there was probably a lot of things at play when i first moved out here to the midwest i had been in for just over 10 years and i was kind of getting pretty burnt out like i said at, at this time i was overseeing the out of country chapters too um i'd help start australia and and um, some of these other 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 countries and well I mean I helped start Australia but I was overseeing some of these other countries and I was finishing graduate school so I just I really had a lot on my plate and I was really starting to focus on my career um, and and my last in my last year of graduate school I had to do two different internships and my second internship was at the Oregon Youth Authority which was a population I was excited to work with um, and they sent me, I got hired at the youth authority as an intern, but they, I had to do like a week long training and they sent me the address to this training and I show up to it and it turned out to be the police Academy. And so I was maybe <laughs> there for a half a day before I got recognized and kicked out. And then I got fired from my position for being a Mongol. They, they were under this grand conspiracy that 
you know, I was trying to get a job at this place so I can recruit members to my, to my gang where it's like, yeah, you think I'm going to school for eight years to try and recruit 16 year old criminals that don't ride motorcycles into my motorcycle club. It made, it made no logical Mm -hmm. sense, but that seemed to be what they believed. Um, And so I I ended up suing the state. um, And so it was in all the papers and I, I won the discrimination lawsuit, which was, you know, it was cool. There wasn't really any money involved, but it was just the principle of it. Yeah. But the flip side of that is, you know, my face was all over the paper and hey, this new social worker is a Mongol. Um, and I knew it was going to be challenging for me to find work in the area. At that same time, I was sitting really heavy into jujitsu and weightlifting and jujitsu and, and was putting a lot more focus on that. Um, and I moved out to the Midwest. My, my wife went to graduate school out here and, you know, it was a good chance for me to find, you know, Uh, work in my field where people didn't know who I was. There was no Mongols out here when I first moved out here. And, um, and then to train at this jujitsu school that's out here, that was my, the biggest thing out here. So I, I had initially moved out here thinking this was going to be my step back, maybe close to retiring. I had told our national P that I was ready to retire. And he just kind of said, man, just play it by ear. Let's see what happens. Just stay, you know, stay active, just check in with me and and we'll see how it goes. And, uh, you know, didn't go that way. I was out here when I first moved out here, there was, one chapter in Indiana and two members left in Kansas city. Um, when I retired, we had a chapter in St. Louis, Missouri, Lake of the Ozarks, Missouri, rebuilt Kansas city, Southern Illinois chapter, Chicago chapter, and then three new chapters in Indiana. So I, I stayed pretty, pretty busy out here. Yeah. So I went from coming out to retiring to just being back to super active. <laughs> um, so, you know, I, again, I was starting to get a little burnt out. Um, our le- national leadership had changed and, there was just kind of some fallout drama from that. And then the new leadership um, were kind of restructuring. They, I mean, just like with anything, right. They want to do things a different way or their own way. And, you know, I was really invested in like this, this regional rep program that I'd built and some other stuff. And they were, they kind of changed how that worked. And, and some of the States that helped start, they kind of changed leadership there. We're putting California guys in charge and, which I'm not saying was a bad move by any means, but it wasn't something I was really agreeing with. To me, it was, we built a certain program to benefit, to fix that. And this seemed like a step backwards. Um, and so there was a little politics involved in it. And then at the time um, they were deciding who's going to be running for the next national P and people, I knew I wasn't going to do it, but a lot of people kept suggesting my name for it and my name was getting brought up. And so I felt like at some point I was starting to maybe even feel like a risk to the current leadership and so they were kind of stripping some of my power away and changing some of my positions. They all st- still st- still treated me well, so I don't want to make it sound like it was anything crazy. Um, mm-hmm. But it was, you know, enough I was paying attention. I was starting to kind of read the writing on the walls. Um, and then, you know, just I think culturally club life has changed a ton in the 15 years I was in. And, um, you know, it, this isn't me- meant to be disrespectful towards any club. But back in the day, I felt like if you joined a, the local main motorcycle club, you were already a pretty well-known guy in your area, right? You likely came from something, whether you were a local gang guy or an ex-military guy, or you maybe even just a local tough guy. Um, mm-hmm. But, you know, over the years, you know, Mongols were doing it. Pagans are doing it, angels over the years. They, I think any club will take anybody at this point, if you're willing to do, you know, willing to prospect or whatever. Um, and so I think the type of members that are now getting into clubs are a little different than the type that were in it when I was in it. And I feel like, there's a newer generation of people that want titles without putting in the work. And instead of being supportive of, oh, hey, this guy's putting in a lot of work and helping us, there's like this weird jealousy and, and shit talking. And it was really undermining the brotherhood to me. And I started kind of feeling like I wasn't being um, appreciated or acknowledged, you know, for, for what was going on there um, nationally anyways. I mean, it still felt good locally and we still had a strong chapter. But so politics were starting to play a piece in it. And then the biggest part, I think, is you know, like I said, I ran a really like strict, stri- uh, like rigid structured program. And there was more and more people starting to join that didn't want to be very active. And we're always complaining about, well, why does this have to be mandatory? And why are we having to go here? And we're, we're, we're too busy. And I, I got to the realization where I felt like the majority of the people, even the club with their new leadership were kind of going this way. And I was trying to stay on the same track. And I had to really question am i doing this for what's best for the club or am i doing it for my ego or what's best for me like if mm-hmm. if the leader if the whole club's wanting to change and i'm the one trying to hold it back it seems like that's selfish of me you know and so it kind of no longer was aligning with my morals and values and it just it seemed like the the right time to just kind of step back and and 
you know, let it do its own thing. Yeah. And so I, I retired initially. I retired. Um, I was retired in good standings. I was allowed to keep my patch and still talk to members. Um, but when I retired, my Southern Illinois chapter was going through some legal problems and one of them had been arrested and he was put on non-association. He wasn't allowed to hang out with the club and our chapter, you know, his blood brother was in the club in our chapter, his coworker, his best friend, like we were all really tight and without, you know, and a lot of them, not to sound arrogant, but a lot of them said, you know, they had joined because of their fr friendship and relationship with me. So with me leaving and then now one of the, their closest, you know, brother and friend leaving, they, they were wondering if why they were sticking with it, you know? And so they decided they were going to leave the club. Well, within the Mongols, if you're not in for 10 years and you leave, you're typically out in bad standings. You can't retire or leave in good standings unless you've been in for 10 years, usually. Mm -hmm. Now, you know, when I was, when I was in leadership and there were some other guys in leadership, it was a more case by case. And I think, I had an argument for them to be able to leave in good standing since it was based off of, you know, some legal stuff and a guy being on non-association probation, but they decided that they were going to be, you know, they were, they're going to stick to the old school rules and these guys are out in bad standing. So mother chapter called me and said, Hey, I know these are your guys. And, and these are guys I do jujitsu with. I work out with, we live in a really small town. So, I mean, there's no avoiding them really, you know? Right. And they said, Hey, they're in bad standing. So you, you know, you can't hang out with them anymore. You can't post pictures with them. And if, if you do, you're, you're in bad standings too. And, um, you know, I, I thought a lot of people always want to talk about loyalty and honor and, you know, these big, these big words, you know, the brotherhood, but I didn't feel like a lot of people are following through with it. And I thought this was my chance to be a man of my word and, and follow through on, on the actions and show that what loyalty really is. And so, you know, I just manned up and told them, Hey, listen, these are my friends and I'm going to keep hanging out with them. And I, I understand what that means, but I'm not going to turn my back on them. You know? And, and they said, well, we hate to hear that, but that means you're out in bad standings. And they sent a message out that said, Hey, you know, Mooch is in bad standings. There's no ill will, but he's, he's going on with it, moved on with his life. Um, so I had to send my patch back and give back my club property. And uh, I'm on no contact with that club anymore. Um, which, you know, it's unfortunate considering that, you know, I started a lot of chapters. I feel like I did a lot of stuff and, and um, you know, maybe some of that's going to get erased from history. I don't know. But at the end of the day, I didn't do it for clout anyways. You know, I was, I always was, whatever I did for the club, I thought I was doing it for the best of the club, not what's going to make me look good. Um, so it was a little bit of an ego check, but it was, you know, it was also good for me, I think. Um, and I think the other part too, is if I were to stay retired, I kind of have one foot in and one foot out and who knows what I would have done with it. Right. But being out, and having that door slammed shut pretty much shoved me out. Um, and that's what gave me the opportunity to start my YouTube channel, to, you know, write this book, um, you know, kind of gave me more freedom to do other stuff. So I, I think in the long run, as much as I would love to be in good standing so I can still talk to people and, and you know, catch up with the guys I've done a lot, you know, spent a lot of time with. Um, in reality, at the time, anyways, it seemed like it, it ended up working out for the best. Yeah, I mean, sometimes that's just how things go. It's uh too bad, you know, on that end, but you know, they, they have their rules, I guess, that they go by and that you, I mean, you lived and died by them, you know, every day. I mean, you put in absolutely all, all that, you know, all that time and, you know, you put in a lot of work day in and day out. And, and so, I mean, for them to, you know, to, to, to just slam the door shut, I mean, I'm sure you, you know, I mean, for you, I mean, it had to have, you know, bothered you on some kind of level, but I mean, like you said, the door was shut, slammed, so after that, you're like, okay, well, now I can do all these other things that I never had the opportunity to do because, you know, you were in good standings or even active in the club. But, I mean, now you got your podcast, the book, and doing counseling and stuff. I mean, it's it's incredible, man, to see how you completely got out of there and got into this. I mean, it's a whole different life. I mean, living day to day, it's got to be different, right? Absolutely. And, and yeah, it was definitely helpful. And, and on the flip side, you know, I, I would be a hypocrite if I was saying that I got done dirty or things are wrong, because when I was in leadership, I followed the rules to a T as well. And, um, you know, I had two of my very best friends in this club that got put out bad and I never talked to them again because those were the rules. Um, you know, being in the position I am now, I kind of regret it and wish <laughs> wish I would have stayed in touch because I know what it feels like to be out. And then all of a sudden, you, you know, you lose all these people you considered friends. Yeah. But I followed the exact same rules, you know, and so when it happened to me, I shouldn't have expected the rules to be any different for me because I'm no different than any other member. So, um, you know, that's when you, when you sign up for an organization like that and, and you agree to those rules, then you, you have to be happy with 
and you break one knowing what the consequences are, you know? Yeah. I mean, there's, I mean, that's what you live by and that's what, I mean, you gotta live by now. I mean, that's what all them other guys are still doing. I mean, but you know, it's, it is what it is. You're doing what you're doing. You're doing your thing. And I'm sure, you know, you've, you've touched a lot more people that you couldn't have by getting this opportunity to, you know, go do your podcast, do go on other shows, go write your book and stuff. I mean, cause it really gives motivation to people. For sure. And, you know, when, when I was in leadership, especially as I aged and kind of saw things, I always, you know, I was always trying to make the Mongols a positive thing. I never wanted to be that, you know, back in that early day, like I said, there was like death or jail adage, right? Oh, you join this club, you're going to lose everything. And mm-hmm. I never wanted to be that guy that brought someone in the club and then their club went downhill because they're in it. I never wanted to hear someone say, oh, I joined the Mongols and it ruined my life. Um, so, you know, I would institute like we had a no in my regions, we had a no meth policy. You know, everyone had to work out at least three days a week. Um, you know, we had a national rule. That everyone has to have a full time job. So you can't be selling drugs. So, you know, we, we really pushed towards making you know people saying, oh, I joined the Mongols and it held me to a certain standard that bettered my life. And so when I left the, the club world, those things I liked and then, you know, the things I didn't like, like the politics and the, the egos with other clubs. And, and I was able to distance myself from that stuff, but still keep the positive stuff. Um, and we started, you know, the other guys that I left with, we started this uh, kind of a movement called Lift, Train, Ride. So we still, you know, we still have that brotherhood. I was still grateful enough that, you know, a lot of people leave club world and then they feel alone and they didn't have the brotherhood they had before. And because of A, my jujitsu team, who've been my family since I've been here, and then B, still having these guys where we meet up once a week to go on rides or go out or barbecue. We have to work out three days a week. So a lot of times we're doing jujitsu together or lifting together. We do a ride together once a month. We do a big yearly ride. So, you know, all the positives that came out of motorcycle club stuff, I still have, and I'm still living it. And then, you know, instead of all the the, the rules and the structure and the leadership and, and the, you know, some of the politics that come with club life, I don't have to deal with that because I don't wear a patch anymore. So, you know, it, th- that part was a big positive for me too, where I got to take the things that I enjoyed in that life and still do it. So I don't feel like I'm missing out. You know, I'm just like, oh, yeah, the, I loved being in that club and I, and I have nothing bad to say about that club. And, I, and I'll always, you know, appreciate and respect that club. I'm not that guy that like, oh, now that I'm in it, I wish it would burn down. I, I know that I'm just one man and the, and the machine's going to move without me, you know. Right. Um, and, and I have a lot of pride in what I did there. So I, I want to see it do well. Um, but it was just no longer for me, you know. And yeah. and but there's still things about that lifestyle I like so that, you know, we took that with us. We're still riding all the time, hanging out together, but we're trying to keep it positive, you know, working out together. Um, between my podcast and other podcasts I've been on, you know, I try to um, support people or, or hopefully motivate people to get back in the gym or to try jujitsu or some sort of martial arts and, you know, just really keep things positive. Yeah. I mean, so you took away the positives from there and then applied them to now. I mean, that's, that's great. I mean, it's a definitely something that you can continue to do. And even the things that you thought you would have lost out on, you know, riding bu- bikes, having the brotherhood, going out to eat or, you know, whatever it may have been. I mean, you still got that with the other guys that are, you know, out of it or whatnot. But no, I, I think you're doing great things, man. I really do. And just keep at it, man. That's all All I can say is, you know, just stay at it. I mean, your story is going to motivate a lot of people. Lots Thank of people. you, man. I, I really appreciate it. That's what, you know, I'm really excited about the book to come out for that reason. You know, it, it wasn't, um, it's a smaller label. It wasn't, there's not a big monetary value in it. It's not something that's going to make me a lot of money, but what I'm hoping is it gets my story out there enough that a can, you know, motivate some people and B open doors for me to meet new people, you know, you know, more do stuff like this, some more podcasts, meet some other people and try and share my story in hopes that, you know, I know I've been hit up a lot on Instagram um, or social media in general, since I've been doing this from other guys that, we're thinking about joining clubs, but they know not sure it was for them. And they realize that they can have a lot of those benefits without wearing a patch. I've been reached out from guys that aren't happy in club life anymore and, and just kind of needed the, the motivation to set out on their own. Um, you know, a lot of guys hit me up about getting into the gym or trying jujitsu. So, you know, the feedback on it's been really, really positive. Good. I'm glad to hear it. And I can absolutely see why. I mean, you're just a chill guy. You know what I mean? You don't talk shit. Like I said, you just, just be you. And, that's what people gravitate to. That's what they like. I mean, some people like the negative and all that shit, but I mean, for you, just straight up, man, you're just cool. You're doing your living your life and just trying to help people out. I mean, you're genuine about it. It's and it's it's real, man. So I respect that. 
Yeah, thank you. And that, that's definitely what I set out to do. You know, wh whether I was a leader in a club or, or just the man I am in life, you know, I'm always trying to set the example or lead, you know, practice what I preach, so to speak, you know, and, and I, you know, I don't want to spread negativity and, and I don't want to talk bad about other people and there, there's no benefit to it. You know, I'd rather be above it and move on and, and, you know, live my own life and continue to be happy and do the positive things and have fun. Um, then dwell on the past or who's done me wrong or, you know, those types of things. Yeah. Because it makes it hard to move on. If you just sit there and think, think, think it don't go away, man. <laughs> Absolutely. And then a lot of that's a victim mentality too. And I'll be the first to say that the consequence of my actions were my choices and I own them, you know? Yeah. So I true. wasn't, I wasn't done wrong. I wasn't a victim, you know, <laughs> I know, no, I know. <laughs> when I was told that you could still be in the club, but if you hang out with these guys, you can't, I was wholeheartedly aware that I would be thrown out bad once I said, I'm going to hang out with these guys. And, yeah. So for me to say, oh, that was messed up or this shouldn't have happened would be pretty hypocritical. So it would be. So no, I'm just it's just about moving on, man. So just keep on moving, man. But I do appreciate you coming on. Where can the people find your podcast? I'll of course put it in the video description, but you know, your book. I mean, what 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 do you got that you want to promote, man? Yeah, so my um podcast is called Mondays with Mooch. It's on YouTube. Um, I'm not super active on it. So the, the whole premise of Mondays with Mooch was I really want to just tell my story. And then when I have guests on it, it's someone that somehow um, our stories intersected or we're getting their perspective of my story, too. So mm -hmm. I kind of only do it when I when I have the urge or, you know, want to talk to some friends or, you know, like I had one with a singer to my band and we talked about touring days. I've had some with some guys from the club stuff. Um, some of my initial ones are more like, you know, kind of club protocol stuff. But that was more just to kind of get my name out there and get some more followers. And the rest of it's going to be my story. So I, you know, I post pretty randomly, but um, when I do, you know, I, li I like what I put out and, and I've had good feedback on it. So that's Mondays with Mooch on YouTube. Um, my Instagram is OG double score, underscore underscore Mooch. Um, and, and I reply to anyone that hits me up on there. So if anyone, you know, needs to talk or to say what's up, you know, hit me up on there. And then my book's coming out um, September 7th and it'll be available from on all major retailers, Amazon, Barnes and Noble. Um, and it's called The Ride of My Life. So That'll be out there uh, in just about a month. Yeah, well, I'm excited for it, man. Like I said, after I read it, man, I'd love to have you back on because, you know, cool. I'll, then I can fully dive into your story instead of watching interviews and stuff. I really want to get into it, man. That's how I do it with, you know, all my guests that I've currently been doing. So I appreciate it. Great. Yeah, it absolutely be ready to come back. It'd be fun. Mooch has really changed his life around for the better. He is the definition of a good redemption story. Lots of people get involved with crime. They can really learn from his story. It's never too late to make a change. Please comment any key takeaways that you got from this interview. Please share it with anyone that you think will enjoy this type of content. Please subscribe to my channel if you want to get more interviews like this. You can also find my clothing brand website in there. Please check it out if you want to support me. And thank you again for watching.